So welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I am Brendan Jones, and I am honored tonight to introduce a writer I have long admired and looked up to, Richard Ford. Born and raised in Mississippi, Ford published his first novel, A Piece of My Heart, in 1976, at the age of 32. He wrote one more novel, The Ultimate Good Luck, before leaving fiction to join the magazine Inside Sports as a reporter. That publication folded in 1982, and he made a last-ditch effort at fiction, writing a book about a novelist, a failed novelist becoming a sports writer, and he actually called the book The Sports Writer. This was that first Frank Bascom story, and it sold well, and he followed this up in 1995 with Independence Day, and this won him both the Penn Faulkner Prize and the Pulitzer. Some years of, after winning the Pulitzer, I heard Richard Ford on the radio, and it was a fall day, and I was driving not far from where he went to college at Michigan State. And the interview on the radio centered around a discussion of his third book in the Bascom series, The Lay of the Land. And attempting at the time to write a novel myself, I paid close attention, as he described, how he kept this notebook for, his, this notebook for the book in his freezer, among his dead pheasants and ducks, in case the house burnt down. <laughs> so toward the end of the interview, in response to a question on whether there might be a fourth Bascom book, he said, nope, I'm done, I'm finished, I won't do it again, too hard. Well, very thankfully, he has done it again, profound and hilarious, particularly in its descriptions of aging and mortality, is how Fresh Air book critic Maureen Corrigan describe, describes Ford's most recent Baskin book, Let Me Be Frank With You. Christopher McElhose, Ford's British publisher, publisher who first heard him read in 1985 and immediately offered to publish anything Ford wrote, had this to say about his work. It is intensely serious. You don't have any sense that it has been worked. And on Ford's public appearances, He's the best reader of his own work in English that I've ever heard. Ford is the author of eight novels and three short story collections with another forthcoming. He has edited two volumes of the Granta Book of the American Short Story and is currently professor of writing at Columbia University. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I welcome Richard Ford. Thank you, Brendan. That's the future of fiction right there. Good, it needs one. Um, I was heard Brendan say about me reading my own work. <clears throat> you know, if you can read your own work well, the implication, of course, is that it's not as good as it sounds when you actually read it aloud. <laughs> and I remember one time I heard, uh, I overheard, I wasn't meant to hear, uh, a guy named Clark Blaze, who's sort of a failed novelist, say um, to somebody as I was about to give a reading, he said, you want to hear this reading? He said, it'll, it'll, it'll never sound as good to you again. <laughs> well, here we are. Um, thanks so much for coming, and, and, and thank you for supporting this. I know... Uh, to be a precious library in this community. Um, um, I, mean, I, I am a child of the library. Um, my mother used to dump me in the Jackson Public Library. Um, she was a single parent in essence, and she could take me there and I would be safe. And I, and I know because every place I go, I travel all over the country all the time, live in, live in far-flung places. It's always to the library that I can go. <clears throat> I can go to the library for this or for that, but mostly I can just go there to be, to read, and just to, just to feel that I'm among friends. Um, so I'm grateful to be here. I'm, I'm going to read you the beginning of the third of these th uh, four uh, connected long stories or novellas, if you like. Um, 
as Brendan said, <clears throat> these, these stories are narrated by Frank Bascom, who narrated these other three long novels. And um, the stories are set right in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy and uh, in the, uh, the late fall of 2012, really just before, just before Christmas. And Frank, who is a former real estate agent, now retired and not very far from here, central New Jersey, uh, <clears throat> has returned to Haddam, the scene of other parts of his life to retire, but his former wife, Anne, has come in with Parkinson's disease to move into an elder care facility, and he now is sort of tasked to go visit her. These are comic stories. <laughs> Out the Haddam Great Road, just past five, freezing rain, has turned the blacktop into after-hours dodgem cars, only a few of us are braving it, our headlights glaring off the pavement like sheeny novas. A Ford Explorer, why is it always a Ford Explorer? It's already gone in the ditch, its driver waving me on with a shrug, a wrecker's on its way. Often the trees on both sides, immense manorial houses twinkle through, Yuletide spruces framed in picture windows blaze outward, sharing Christmas cheer with the less moneyed. Years ago, I drove out here on just such a gloomy wintry night to hand deliver a $2 million full price offer on a slant roof architect design monstrosity that's since been torn down and calamitously hit a dog, precisely next to the house I was hoping to sell. As with the Explorer, I went straight in the ditch, but clambered out up and across the black ice road to bring whatever helpless help I could to the poor wrecked beast who'd made a whomp when I hit it, boating ill. I, of course, feared it was my client's dog. <laughs> there the poor thing lay in the ice-crusted grass in front of number 2605, breathing deep, rasping, not long for this world breaths. Its sorrowing eyes resigned and open to the snowy night, its last, not offering to move or even to notice me, beside it and on my knees, my cold hand on its hairy hard ribs, feeling them rise and fall, rise and fall. It was a hound, a black and tan, somebody's old love bug, a wiggly crotch sniffer and shoe muncher bought for the kids yet surviving on after they'd gone and now primed to be hit. What can I do for you, old Towser? I said these absurd words, knowing their answer. Nothing, thanks. You've done enough. <laughs> After minutes, I hiked up to the house I was selling, shamefaced and in shock. I informed my clients what I'd terribly done. We all three walked down to the road in the snow, but the old boy had passed beyond us and was, because it was cold, grown stiff and peaceful and perfect. They didn't know whose dog it was. The hunters strayed away in the night, they thought, though it was past the season for that. My clients, the Armentis, long since beyond life's, life's pale themselves, felt a sorrow for me and my plight and let me go home with the promise to do something about the dog in the morning. I shouldn't worry. It was a terrible night to be out, which it was. In my realtor's memory, they accepted the offer Following some testy back and forths with the young Bengali buyers, I often recollect such matters more positively than was true. It was a long time ago, 20 years at least. The dog, of course, lives on. I am on my pilgrim's way tonight. It's only 5.10, but could easily be midnight. To visit my former wife, Ann Dykstra, a resident now of the Beth Wessel Wing at the community at Carnage Hill, a state-of-the-art staged care facility out here in what was once, when we were married 40 years ago, the verdant Haddam hinterlands. The community today borders a Robert Trent Jones faux lynx course hidden from the road by a swatch of woods, the leaves now down. A birch bark canoe institute sits off to the left in deeper timber, its lights busily yellowing the snow flittery night. Other grand houses are semi-visible, accessible by gates with uniformed protection. Once it was possible to cast my eye over almost any piece of settled landscape here around and know how it would look in the future, what uses it'd be set to by succeeding waves of human purpose as if a logic lay buried within, 
the genome of its later what's it. Though out here now, all is frankly enigma. Probably it's my age, which explains more and more about me, like a master decryption code. In New Jersey, we've now built to the edge of the last million acres of remotely developable land. We're on track to use it up by mid-century. Property taxes are capped, but no one wants to sell since no one wants to buy, all of which keeps prices high but values low. My mission into the night's sinister weather four days before Christmas is to deliver to my former wife, Anne, a special yoga-approved, form-fitted, densely foamed and molded orthopedic pillow which she can sleep on, and that's recommended by neurologists in Switzerland to homeopathically treat Parkinson's, all of, wh of which she's a new sufferer, by reducing stress levels associated with poor sleep, which themselves are associated with neck pain, which is associated with too vivid dreams, all associated with Parkinson's. <laughs> Anne has resided in the Beth Wessel able-bodied independent wing since last June. She has her own two-bedroom, Feng Shui approved apartment, does her own cooking, drives her own focus, and has even acquired a boyfriend, a Philadelphia cop named Buck. His last name, <clears throat> he has a last name, but I can't pronounce it since it's Polish. Buck's a large, dull piece of cordwood in his 70s, given to loose fitting, permanently belted trousers matching beige sweatshirts of the kind sold at Kmart, big galunker imitation suede shoes and the thinnest of pale hosiery. Somewhere, someone convinced Buck that a sculpted imperial and a pair of black horn rimmed Dave Garraway specs would make him look less like a Polish meatball and make people <laughs> take him more seriously, which probably never happens, though he's officially on record as handsome. He could pass as the good cop who genially interrogates the poor black kid from the projects until he suddenly loses his temper, bulges his eyes, balls up his horseshoe fists in the kid's face and scares the shit out of him. Buck's carrying around a different John Grisham book every time I see him and refers to himself only as a first responder. I regularly encounter him lurking in the big public living room. He doesn't have enough to do now with no robberies and home invasions to get his mitts into. He likes the idea that Anne, whom he infuriatingly calls Miss Annie, that Anne and I, quote, go way back, end quote, which isn't quite the word for it and that he and I share private, implicitly sexual understandings about her that men such as we are would never speak about, but that in the aggregate are special, possibly symbolic, and render us both lucky to have lived this long foot soldiers in Miss Annie's army. <laughs> like me, Buck's a prostate survivor, and his personal talk is the sort that would drive Anne straight to the rafters. It includes his rank disdain for Viagra. No need for that junk. I prize my stiffy, let me tell you. <laughs> the existence of a horse pill obtainable online that makes us prostate guys piss like Percherons, thereby avoiding the men's room blues. <laughs> Needless to say, he doesn't like Obama and blames him for shit canning the American dream by creating a lost decade when it came to the little people keeping up. He's a nice guy, meaning the president, but he wasn't ready to assume the mantle, yippity, yippity, yippity. Bush, of course, was ready. <laughs> and I'm convinced, spends time with him only to display for me the limitless variety of homo sapiens who can easily fill my long, empty shoes. <laughs> the why should affairs of his heart and hers be less inscrutable than the affairs of my own? It's not, however, the simplest of emotional transits to be driving out four days before Christmas to visit my ex-wife. We've been divorced 30 years in an extended care facility, suffering an incurable and fatal disease, and with whom I have not been all that friendly, but who's now a 20-minute drive away and somehow or other presenting issues. Relations end nowhere, the poet said. 
how Ann Dykstra came to reside 20 minutes from my doorstep is a bittersweet tale of our time and should serve as cautionary if one's long ex-wife constitutes a demographic possible to comprehend and thus beware of. When Ann retired off the athletic faculty of the Tocqueville Academy, she'd begun keeping time but expecting nothing serious with one of her de Tocqueville colleagues, the lumbering, swarthy-skinned, curly-haired, ex-Harvard math whiz and lifelong mother's boy, Teddy Fuchs. Years before, Teddy had been headed for celestial math greatness, but had suffered a, quote, dissociative episode, end quote, on the eve of his thesis defense on rectilinear quadratic equations and been banished to prep school teaching at de Tocqueville, a not long drive from where his parents lived on the shore in Belmar. At de Tocqueville, Teddy was regarded by all as profound and gentle and, what else, super bright, and having this special connection with kids which persuaded everybody that prep school teaching was his true métier rather than being a chaired professor at Caltech with a clear shot at Nobel but possibly never being really, really happy like the rest of high school teachers. <laughs> Teddy, at age 60, had never married, but had avoided the standard smirks and yorks and back-channel eye-rollings about his sexuality by being benign. There were no rumors of Greenwich Village a deux sightings or mysterious friends brought to the faculty cookouts. Some people really are what they seem. No, though not that many. <laughs> Teddy and Anne began seeing each other, began being a couple, taking trips to Turks and Caicos, Tel Aviv, the Black Sea port of Odessa, and speaking exclusively in terms of the other. I'll have to ask Anne about that. You know, back when Teddy was at Harvard, Anne has the tea time. Teddy wrote an influential paper about that in his junior year, which has caused a lot of stir. These are mostly things she would never have said about me since flogging suburban homes on cul-de-sacs that were once cornfields in West Windsor rarely gets you noticed by the folks at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. <laughs> I know any of this only because our daughter Clarissa Bascom, now a veterinarian in Scottsdale, told me. Clarissa has, Clarissa has always kept semi-taught lines with her mother, though much tauter with me and her brother. Back when it was all getting started with Teddy, Clarissa believed her mom could tolerate only a platonic relationship and that there was neither hanky nor panky afoot. That Teddy, though large, levantine, hairy, and apparently sensual, was in fact harmless and remote from his body. Lesbians think they know everything. <clears throat> and that after Anne's two marriages to two unsatisfactory men, one of them me, being with a man like Teddy, thoughtful, hopelessly reliable, obedient, occasionally mirthful, but not that much. No bad history with women, a good cook, and important, most important, Jewish, guaranteeing, Clarissa believed, no unwanted sexual advances. <laughs> Teddy was all but perfect. Like most explanations, it's as plausible as anything else. Plus, Teddy, plus Clarissa liked Teddy. I only met him twice by accident, but they had Harvard in common, and for all I knew, sat up late nights singing the fucking songs. <laughs> Long story short, it's never short enough. Ann retired, and so did Teddy, whose mother had conveniently died at age 90. Ann had dove from her second marriage. Teddy had his dead parents' 3,000-square-foot condo overlooking the sea in Belmar. A charmed coming together, it seemed, was forged for both parties, an acquaintance that <clears throat> hesitantly blossomed into something more instead of the usual less, a mutually acknowledged, if somewhat not fully shared, sense of life's being better when not spent dismally alone, a willingness to try to take an interest in the other, learn golf, learn calculus, plus the condo. Ann and Teddy sent around at-home announcements. One actually came to me declaring the, quote, uniting of all our assets, real, spiritual, and virtual, end quote. I took note 
but not serious note, as far as I was concerned, and had simply embarked on another new course in life the main source of interest and primary selling point of which was that it carried her further away from being my wife and nearer to becoming just another person I might never have known, whose obituary my eye might pass over without the slightest pause or twinge, which is the goal and most perfect paradigm of what we mean when we say divorce. Thank you. <clears throat> Oh, I'll read them, but I don't want to leave it on that note. <laughs> Made all the divorced people in the audience feel terrible. <laughs> Though, of course, that's crazy. The kids see to it, as does memory, which, short of Alzheimer's, never lets you off the mat. Following which, and after four years of landing on glaciers in minuscule airplanes, walking the Via Dolorosa barefoot, two trips to the Masters, the lifelong dream of Anne's, backcountry treks to the Maghreb, plus any number of books on tape, videos of Harvard lectures on neuroplasticity, trips to Chautauqua to hear washed up writers squawk about what it's like to be them, plus four visits to Mayo to keep up with heart anomalies. Teddy believed he'd inherited from his Harvard experience. Following all that, Teddy simply died one morning while sitting an oversized baby in the Atlantic surf wearing pink bathing trunks. An aneurysm, dead at 64, as Paul Harvey used to say. <laughs> Anne, who was on the 10th floor balcony watching him with pleasure, saw him topple face over into the sea. She thought he was playing a joke and laughed and waited for him to ride himself. He had had a comic side. <laughs> Anne lived on in the condo after Teddy's death. I had no idea of what she did or how she did it. Mom's fine was the most Clarissa would allow, as if I was not allowed to know. Paul Bascom, our son, an unusual man apart on his best day, and now happily running a garden supply in KC, mentions, maintains only a distant fondness for his mother, and so had nothing to inform me about her. Complications and unfathomables in dealing with one or another aging parent seem now to be the norm for all modern offspring. Thank you. Reading that passage, which I've done a, a couple of times, I, I, all of my life, ever since I started writing novels, I, I've, read my, I've read my books aloud to my wife, which usually takes five weeks, all day, every day. She sits with the manuscript, and I sit with the manuscript, and I read, and she follows along, and when she has something to say, she says it, and when I see things I don't like, I stop and we fix it, and those are, she, she enjoys those things, but they are for me very volatile. I'm a very volatile person, and I, and I get very angry when I see things that I don't like, <clears throat> and I've always done that, but I, but I knew that there was a pitfall to doing that, and the pitfall to doing that is that it, I'm dyslexic, so for me, it's, it's, it's almost completely necessary to get all the words in the right place because when you're dyslexic, words tend to wander away from where they belong and sometimes wander away and become other words. And, um, but, but, but this time, but this is the first book, I didn't read these stories aloud to her. <clears throat> and the reason was that I thought that when I read things aloud, which are meant to be read silently by someone who reads the book, I feel like reading them aloud um, has a tendency to sort of oversimplify sentences and s cause them to submit to my reading voice. Whereas if, if, if they were allowed to be slightly more complicated, the reader wouldn't, would, wouldn't have any difficulty with them. It would just be a little harder for me to read. So I didn't do that this time, for the first time. Uh, and as a consequence, the sentences in this book for me are harder, are harder to read um, um, out, out loud. Because I didn't, I haven't really sort of <clears throat> filed them and filed them and filed them. And filed. I mean, I did everything I knew how to do. I read them aloud to myself, 
I certainly did that, which is what I always do. But, I, but so I, I notice when I read them, that the sentences have certain little sort of gremlins in them when I read them, and, I, and I, um, I'm glad for that in one way, but it somehow um, sort of frustrates me sometimes when I'm trying to read them aloud. Um, if anybody has a question, I'll be happy to. Yes, sir. Would you, would you let this gentleman amplify your voice? Thank you very much for being here and with your wonderful reading. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you come from a state with a strong, rich literary tradition. I'm wondering how much that <clears throat> tradition influenced you as you were becoming a writer. And secondly, uh, you've been quoted as having expressed some ambivalent feelings about Mississippi. Um, would you please comment on all of that? Well, you can't be from Mississippi without having ambivalent feelings about it. Um, thank you. Um, well, there were lots of things, you know, that Mississippi gave as a gift to me. Um, to, you know, to grow up on the same street as Eudora Welty was a great gift. And, and, and even though I didn't know Eudora, I knew that she was around. And her presence in Jackson, and, you know, just setting Faulkner aside, uh, just Eudora right there in Jackson. It, 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 um, it conferred on anybody who might have wanted to be a writer in that time and in that town a freedom. Because to, to decide you want to be a writer, at least in Mississippi, which is bigoted and conservative and very much dedicated to things as they should be, you have to kind of go against the grain at a certain point. You have to set certain kinds of, um, set certain kinds of uh, formalities aside. And n knowing Eudora B was there made that possible because it basically said no normal, ordinary people who, who live on these streets can become good writers. That was one thing. The other thing, and the other things were, um, have to do with race, of course, necessarily relations between blacks and whites in Mississippi. Um, it was a terrible situation to be black in Mississippi then, um, somewhat, somewhat better now. Um, but it was, it, it was not so great even to be, to be um, a white kid during that time, particularly a white kid with a brain, because you were being told over and over again that things that you could see to be true were not true. You were being told that people across on the other side of town were less than you, that you shouldn't associate with them, that you shouldn't socialize with them, that you shouldn't date them, that you shouldn't play sports against them, that you shouldn't go to church with them, that you shouldn't eat in restaurants with them. And what that did, if you were you know, a little white kid like I was, it, it made you not trust anything. And it, and it made you it made you think that that ordinary reality was absurd, because there was this enormous discrepancy between what you could see to be true, and what everybody was living as true, and everybody who was your color was living as true, and so that kind of absurdity was use, is useful to a writer because it makes you a little trenchant in how you in how you look at things, and the final thing was that I, I, I and probably there are more than these but these are three important ones. Um, there's a way in which being a novelist is, is a kind of uh, um, enlightened form of, of both inquiry and of, of, of reconciling seemingly irreconcilable things. And race relations, when I was there, was one of those really irreconcilable things. And so, so writing novels is a kind of form of explanation which tries somehow to bring these irreconcilable parts of life closer together. I mean, you know, in, in Absalom, Absalom, when, um, when Quentin Compson says, I don't hate it, I don't hate it, and then throws himself off the Harvard Bridge into the, into the river, into the Charles River, uh, that's really what that's about, uh, about trying to make the way you were taught be the way you thought. And, and that creates some, uh, some torques. And, and if you've got some torts to work with as a novelist, then you've got something. Anything else? It's a gentleman in the back with, on the aisle. Uh, thank you, Hello. Mr. Ford. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one, following up on the uh, Mississippi, the state of New Jersey plays a role in certainly in the Frank Bascom novels. And 
you obviously have lived there, and that's probably one of the reasons. But are, are there other aspects about the state of New Jersey that you found compelling to uh, feature in your novels? Is this a, is this a question founded in, in incredulity? <laughs> Well, I did live in New Jersey for many years, so maybe, maybe it is. Well, uh, and, um, the, and the second question is, should we assume that the town of Haddam is Princeton? Um, it's the, second one, the second one first. Haddam is probably not Princeton down to the letter. It probably has bits of Lawrenceville built into it, bits of, bits of Hopewell built into it, bits, bits of Penn's Neck built into it. But probably if you were to graph it out, you could, you could probably come up with a pretty persuasive map of Princeton. Yeah, you could, because that's where I was living when I started writing the sports writer one on Easter Day in 1982. Um, why, why New Jersey? Uh, there, there are some, for me, real, question, real answers to, to, to that, not just that I happened to be there. When, as, as Brendan said, I sort of beached as a sports writer and came back to Princeton with nothing to do, and my wife said, why don't you write a novel about somebody who's happy? I think, I think she got a little tired of my romanticism at that point. Um, the first thing I thought that I could be happy about <clears throat> was was the state of New Jersey and living there, because I because I knew that most people out in the world thought of New Jersey as the back of an old radio, and uh, and I thought, well, that it just isn't my experience. I actually kind of like it. And, and so why, why, why don't I try to find language for something that might be difficult otherwise to put language to, which is a positive spin on this place. Um, and, and so that involved me in actually having to think about how I actually felt about it, which is always useful. Um, and, and the second is that New Jersey is a kind of wonderful microcosm of the rest of the country. It's got these big river valleys, and it's got the ocean, and it's got the teeming cities, and it's got the savanna down in Burlington County, and it's, and it's, and it's, got, the, it's, got, it's got so much. It's got swamps, it's got forests, it's got big rivers, it's got mountains of a sort. And um, so I, I thought, you know, I, I can make this claim. I can make, you know, you have to find things that you can actually aver. And I could aver that about New Jersey, and I also happen to believe it. So those, those were the things. Those were the things. And, and also, you know, I'm teaching a course in Columbia right now called, called Sense of Place, which is uh, kind of fun to teach. It's just, it's just a short six-class course. And, um, and we talk about all aspects of Sense of Place, where you set your story, what, you know. And you, you should probably try as a novelist to, to set your story in some place where you can make anything happen. If you think about John Cheever's great story, uh, Reunion, uh, it, which takes place on the, in the Grand Concourse of Grand Central Station, you set a story there, you can have anything that you can dream up happen there. And anything, in New Jersey, you can, you can make anything happen in, in New Jersey, you know, you, because it has, it has everything. That's why I chose Great Falls, Montana to set so many other stories, because I could make anything happen there. And there was, no, there was nothing about the place that was constraining. And, I, you know, and you want to also have a place that has a wonderful language associated with it. So any, any state that has a town called Cheesequake, <laughs> you, want to, you want to put that, you want to put that, or Hapatcong, or, all of, you know, lots of names, all those old Indian names. So that, those are the reasons. Thanks, man. Yes, sir. At the end of that story that you were reading, um, you or Frank says that love is not a a thing. I'm going to misquote you slightly, probably. Love is not a thing; it's a series of single acts. That's right. And I wondered if you felt like that was true generally, or only when a relationship is largely extinguished. No, no, I, no, no. I don't. I don't think that. Um, I mean, um, I mean, I, th I think it's you know. <clears throat> um, Novels like poems and like short stories are, are, are trying to address, large, at least if I'm writing them, they're trying to address the most important things I know. And, and, and to try to, you know, give yourself an opportunity to say what love is, is really, is really an attractive thing to try to do if you can sort of put it into a context that makes it seem inevitable. 
um, whether or not love, whether or not love is or is something more than a series of discrete acts, I don't, I don't really know. But, but I wanted Frank to say that, and I, and I wanted him to try to reconcile his relationship with his wife, with his behavior toward her. And, and you might say, as the reader of that story, well, I don't really believe that. I, I don't think that love is just a series of discrete acts, not a thing otherwise. But that's what novels want to do. They want to advance these provisional positions and let the reader have a conversation with it. So, I mean, the, the very fact that you read that and thought to yourself, hmm, I wonder if that's true. And then you ask me if I wonder if it's true. I, I, think, it's, I, I, I think it's in the vicinity of truth. I think it's I think it's close to close to being true, and and and, and in the way that it and in the way that it weeds out the filaments of whatever love is, it's a value to 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 advance that as a provisional, a medial point of view. Thank you. I'm I'm glad nobody ever asked me that before, other than me. <laughs> is there anything else? Yes, sir. It's a gentleman in the back. Uh, thank you for your presentation. We all appreciate it. It's a pleasure. The, the role of sports in American society today, from the perspective of a sports writer, but the fact that, as we all know, having grown up over the last 40, 50 years, how large a presence it is for schools, universities, professional, and it seems to have had such a more dominant role. Do you see this as a basis to come back and look at that theme? and? Yeah a book that could address the American, I don't want to use a too strong word, but almost obsession with sports today as compared to, say, 50 years ago. Do you see that as a change? I, I may be too old to do that. Uh, I, 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 I'm not very interested in sports much anymore. And um, I, mean, I play squash three or four times a week, but I have a hard time sitting down in front of the TV um, letting myself be treated to the way sports are put across to us on, on television and in the, in the broadcast media of, of, of all sorts. I mean, now we're, all we're hearing about are athletes' um, drug convictions and their bank accounts and the fights with their spouses and uh, all, all of these things. I'm not interested in that. I never thought that athletes were, were role models. And, 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 I think, and I think it's completely hypocritical of, 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 of Americans to believe that uh, it's just typical kind of Puritanism in, in America to, to, to cause athletes to be role models for us. What, what, what possible qualifications <laughs> could they have to be role models? And yet we, yet we, 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 we heighten them in our esteem and, and, and saturate them with our attention and, and they don't live up, of course, how, how, how could they? I'm just interested in the game, you know? Um, I, I, I live in Ireland part of the year and one of the things I like to do is go to hurling matches. Hurling is, I, I, it would take me all night to explain hurling to you, but it, it wouldn't be very interesting. But it's a, it's, a, it's a game played on a county level by all amateur, uh, amateurs, both boys and girls play. And you can go to these wonderful matches and it's just that. It's just the game and the boys and girls playing it. And it's terrific and there's not very much hype except you get to the end when it's the All-Ireland and then there are two teams, one from Kilkenny and one from Donegal and they play at Croke Park in, 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 in Dublin. But otherwise it's just down at the grassroots level and it's not on TV all the time. It's great. It's just wonderful. But, I, but, you know, I'd have to take an interest in sports, which I no longer really have. And I think in some ways I don't have one because it's been drubbed out of me. Yeah. And it started being drubbed out of me when I was a sports writer talking to people like Bo Schembechler. <laughs> Bo Schembechler. Yes, sir. You see? You mentioned it, um, reading out loud, you, you heard some gremlins in, tonight. Could you tell us what you mean by a gremlin, and could you give oh, us some a, examples? A sentence that's just kind of bumptious in the middle. Could you give us, like... No! Okay. <laughs> Take my word for it. 
<laughs> you know, I, I, Frank, as a, as, a, as a locus of language, which is what a character is, 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 is given to, to hyphenating words and, hyph and, and running words together using hyphens. I like that when I, make, when I make him do that. But then when I read those things, then I have a heart. I stumble over them sometimes when I read them out loud. And, and they seem to work fine when you see them, but they don't work fine coming, coming out of my mouth. And I just noticed there were certain kinds of locutions that I know had Christina and I read this book aloud, would probably have gotten smoothed over. I would have had to break a few clipboards over my head before it happened, but, but, um, but I didn't want that. I, I literally didn't want that, and I, I wanted the sentences to be as complex as they, as they, as they sh I felt should have been. And so I, so I, left, I left that in without doing that, you know, that masonry work of laving it and laving it and laving it. Uh, but they're there, they're, they're, they're there, just, I don't even wish they weren't, uh, but I'm not going re, to re, resubmit them to you. <laughs> yes, sir, please. Uh, I heard you and uh, Sam Shepard read one night in New York, and what you will remember was billed as the macho man. Oh, you. Lord. That's what I was hoping you would say. Um, but I, I, <laughs> poor I, Sam, poor me. <laughs> um, I was curious as to That's what when you, Phil Hoffman introduced him, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah. I think so, yeah. yeah. Any further comment? About, about Sam? Well, no, no, about, not about Sam, but just about uh, what you were saying to one another as you went out for that. Um, well, we weren't talking about macho stuff, as you would, would imagine. We were just, you know, talking about what writers always talk about. Yeah. Women, real estate, and money. <laughs> <You know. laughs> Some, although Sam said a wonderful, Sam said a wonderful thing. I'll have to, I'll tell this on him. He, we were, we were sitting somewhere, not that night. I'll never forget this. And I, I, Sam's a great guy, and um, he said, um, he said, hey, hey, man, he said, what, what are you reading these days? And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm reading. Um, Jane Austen. He said, Jane Austen. He said, I never read books by chicks. <laughs> That's really all I need to tell you, right? <laughs> I, I may have been lying about Jane Austen, too. <laughs> if, if, there's, if, there, if there's one more question, I'll be happy to answer it. And if, if, if not, I'll, yes, sir, in the back. Thank you. Uh, in the introduction, uh, Brendan, I guess it is, yes. uh, quoted you saying uh, that no way would you ever go back to Frank Bascom. Yes. Why, did, Why did he call you back? Well, because um, <clears throat> in my notebook, I always am writing lines, you know, writing sentences. And some of those sentences I know when I write them down are sentences that Frank Bascom could say or think or describe his behavior in some way. But I, I'd write them down, and I, and I put FB, circle it beside it. But I, after I finished the lay of the land, I, I really intended never to do that again because finishing the lay of the land, which was a really long book, was, was really not a pleasant experience for me because uh, I did read it out loud, and, uh, et cetera. Um, but when, 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 when Hurricane Katrina came along, Christina and I uh, were living in Maine. She had uh, just months before been the head of city planning for the city of New Orleans and Mayor Nagin fired her. And um, so she came back to Maine to live with me. And, um, but after that calamity, we went back down to New Orleans and I, I worked for Habitat and worked for churches and helped build houses in the Ninth Ward. And she worked for ACORN. And we did all we could do to just try to take part in the rebuild. And then after a while, we left and went back to Maine. And, um, and then I, I wrote a piece, in, in fact, in the New York Times about Hurricane Katrina and um, thought that would be it. And then when, when Sandy came along, we were both in New York. And so we took a little sort of calamity tourist trip down there one day across the bridge at Tom's River over to Seaside Heights, to Seaside Park and Lavalette and Ortley Beach right after the hurricane when you could get across into there. And on the way home, I just noticed that... Um, I was thinking some Frank Bascom lines. 
and, and, and we had all been saturated again with the media, with the press, of all of the things the press would tell you over and over and over and over again until you really no longer even cared about it. And I thought there must be consequences to this storm that no one knows about and that I could maybe imagine and make up to profit. So, uh, and I don't, I don't mean, no, I don't mean the hat. <laughs> no, no. Believe me. There ain't no profit in this. <laughs> But to profit for the reader, I mean, I, 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 I mean, it, you know, j just because you can write a book doesn't mean you should. And 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 for me, I was 68. How old Frank is in this book? I, I really felt like I shouldn't write a book unless I felt like there was a, a readership for it, and that that readership could f use that book in some way, make some use of it. And, when I, and, and, and what had happened to me was that when I was doing this book tour for Canada, the book that I wrote two years ago, a lot of people would come and have book signs and they would say to me, oh, you're really never going to write this again? You're really never going to write Frank Bascom again? And I said, well, I don't think so. And they very kindly would say to me, well, I wish you would. We would like to read it if you, if you would. And, and that's not a reason to write a book either, but it's not irrelevant. It's not irrelevant for, for, for human beings to come up to you and say, I wish you would do something, because if you did something as well as you can do it, I, I think I would have a use for it. So that was, a, that was an, an, an impulse which I remembered and, and heard then after Hurricane Sandy. Thank you all.